dialysis is basically a cardiovascular workout at rest. So if you ever do a cardiovascular workout, you know how tired you feel after working out. Go for a run, do a cardiovascular workout, you know how that feels. So basically, I feel that way. The only difference is I don't have the burning of the muscles because I did not use my muscles in the exertion. So with that being said, that also can be stressful on the heart. So if you're doing a five or 600 blood flow, it is for that reason that you're doing that blood flow because you only have three to four hours of time to dialyze. Versus in places like Japan, they'll do six, seven, eight hour dialysis sessions. But the flow is slower. So they may be doing a 200 to 250 blood flow, which is easier on what? The heart. But because it's not prof for profit, they don't have to turn over as many patients in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of us are dying faster more often because these companies want to turn over a profit a lot more and so that's one of the reasons why it is worse off when you have for-profit dialysis facilities than you do have non-profit or if you have a dialysis facility that is ran in a country that has either single payer healthcare or a nationalized healthcare system. Guys and girl, do, do you know anybody that's on kidney dialysis besides myself? Uh, not currently. Um, my best friend, her mother was on dialysis for years, for years. No. Okay. So um, I've been on dialysis uh, in May, it'll be 16 years. So, yeah, I've been on it for quite a bit and I've seen quite a lot over the last 16 years. But the question is, what is dialysis? So let me give you an explanation of what it is. So dialysis is basically a uh, machine is basically a mechanism that has a series of pumps and those pumps uh, it connects what we call two lines. You have the arterial line, you have the venous line. So it could either be done through two needles, which are in an axis, like for instance, my arm, I hope you guys aren't squeamish, but here's my arm. Yes, it has a lot of scars, but that's from dialysis access, right? So you have the arterial and the venous, right? Some people, what they have is called a perm cath. Those are usually put either inside the chest or sometimes it can be put inside the groin, but you have an arterial side and the venous side. Blood goes out from one side, goes through the pump, and it goes through a filter. The filter is typically a long tube with thousands of fibers, and those fibers are miniature tubes which the blood goes through, and this is called a dialyzer. This dialyzer goes through a reverse osmosis procedure which it pulls out excess fluid and impurities. So it basically does what the kidneys are supposed to do with inside your body. Also, medications are given through it as well. Uh, for instance, a particular medication that stimulates the bone marrow into creating red blood cells so that you are not anemic. So with that being said, it cleans the blood, which is what the kidneys are supposed to do, and then it puts the blood black inside the body, and it goes through cycles, uh, many cycles within the span of time that your dialysis is, whether it's three, four, five hours, what have you. So that is the process of dialysis. This is a life-sustaining process that keeps the person alive. So that's what it is. And there are thousands of people in this country who are on dialysis as we speak, like myself. It essentially keeps me alive. 
So just to let you guys know, if I were to not have dialysis for say about two weeks, I'm dead. That's just how it is, right? So with that being said, we all know and we all have finding out now that dialysis is big business. Now, there was an article that was recently written by Matt Stoller that I actually want to get into. Yes, uh, I think it was about 18 months ago or so. I actually criticized Matt, Matt Stoller about some things that he said before. But this is one of those articles where Matt Stoller actually gets it right. And so I want to give him a shout out for this article here. And yes, guys and girl, I will be going to you for some commentary on this as well. But I want to get into this. Now, if, if is there any thoughts that you have about what I basically explained about uh, the dialysis process? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's other than, obviously, this is something that it takes up so much of your life. And it's, it's not something you can say no about. You already pointed that out. This is, this isn't a matter of, this isn't, do you want a video game? This is, do you want to live or not? Basically, yeah. So let's share this article here. So thank you so very much to Matt Stoller for this, uh, this article. And as a dialysis patient, I will be lending my anecdotal evidence to this. So... It says, the dirty business of clean blood. The blurb says, we have given the power of life over death over more than half a million people to two dialysis monopolies, Davida and Fresenius. A non-compete ban could change that. So this came out just three days ago from Matt Stoller. Let's get into this. So... Just making sure that I go over my notes here because I do have a lot of notes. Uh, so at the beginning of this, he actually goes over how uh, some people who are dialysis patients have uh, felt threatened from some dialysis facilities back then. Back then, I mean around 15 to 20 years ago. And he says he talked about them talking to Congress about their negative experiences from dialysis. Uh, and so one thing I want to focus on is how dialysis in America is a microcosm of Medicare for all. So let me just make sure I go here. Let me see here. Let me see. Okay. So he says, it's so it's awful to have your kidneys fail. But in some ways, dialysis is also a uniquely remarkable medical story. Prior to the creation of modern dialysis in the 1960s, pretty much everyone whose kidneys stopped functioning would die, like myself. Today, not only can you stay alive, but every American can get access to this treatment even if they can't pay. And that's because in 1972, Congress and President Richard Nixon signed a mini Medicare for All law specifically for dialysis, guaranteeing that anyone who has the disease can get treatment on the government dime, no matter their age or income level. Your thoughts about this? Oh my gosh. Um... The fact that Richard Nixon is left of the Democrats is terrifying. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, man. Tricky Dick continues to surprise us all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read this paragraph as well. It says, unfortunately, the creation of this universal treatment for dialysis occurred just as the anti-monopoly tradition in commerce and in medicine fell apart. What happened in the next, what happened next in this industry is similar, though not identical to the general story of consolidation in the rest of the economy. The similarity is that there was a massive roll up of private power in the hands of corporate chains. But in contrast to say the rise of Walmart and its power over retail, dialysis is run wholly with public money. So care delivery and dialysis is about 
corporate giants intertwined with big government. In April, I wrote about how consolidation in healthcare was supercharged by Obamacare. Dialysis is that same story in micro. It's more like the defense industrial base than big tech. So we're going to get into this, it's a, but one of the things I wanted to reflect on, it says one of the biggest surround, issues surrounding dialysis is the consolidation of companies to make a monopoly. Dialysis is monopolized by Fresenius and DeVita. So while I, you know, this article is really great, I want to go into a particular video that also talks about this as well. This is going to be a, dare I say, interesting deep dive into dialysis and how it is monopolized and use government funds in order to keep that money aflowing. So let's go here. Uh, we got to stop at 54 seconds. So let me share the screen. Hello. So let me go to 54. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me see. All right, we can go there. All right, so let's get into this. Believe it or not, dialysis is 1% of the entire federal budget alone. Just not for health care, not for like kidney care, but just dialysis is 1% of the entire federal budget. Did you know that? I did not know that. I'm costing y'all a lot. <laughs> but you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Dialysis is massive business. If we, look, I'll put it this way. Let me put myself back up here. If dialysis is 1% of the federal budget, can you imagine how much money DeVita and Fresenius are making? Good point. Good point. And how much of that, yeah, a corollary to what you just said, how much of that is profit? Baby. Mm. Can we talk about, can we talk? Can we talk? <laughs> can we talk? Can I we know talk? I can, can we talk? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm from the Bronx, so that works. Of course. <laughs> That's why I'm saying it. That's why I yeah. love it. <laughs> well, Welcome to Coffee Talk. My name is Linda Richmond. We'll have coffee. We'll talk. No big <laughs> whoop. <laughs> you know, I'm also, sorry. no, that's okay. In a different economic structure, maybe we would have had something better than dialysis by now. You ain't saying nothing but a word. Mm, let's get into it. This is this. Let's continue. Now, this podcast goes in detail, uh, is a detailed investigation of the two largest dialysis companies in America, DeVito, which is based in Colorado, and Fresenius, which is actually a German company. They're both publicly traded. Um, now, DeVito and Fresenius run 5,000 dialysis clinics out of the total of 7,500 dialysis clinics in America. In other words, two thirds. Now, just a decade or so ago, like 80% of dialysis facilities used to be independent. And now two thirds of them are run by just two companies. Now Monopolies. 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 Oh my God. Capitalism breeds competition. <laughs> no, it, it does innovation. To the extent that there is obstacles to entry, it does not. And to create, to do something as complicated as dialysis has built in obstacles to entry. Mm -hmm. you, you can't wake up in the morning and go, hey, I'm going to run a dialysis center. Oh, we're going to get into that too. There's more to that. Let's continue. Now, a specific healthcare researcher and economist from Duke University did an analysis of 
all these acquisitions, right? Essentially, I mean, this is nothing new. Davida and Fresenius are just engaging in a roll-up strategy where you take one company and you roll up a whole bunch of small ones underneath them and you get a variety of economic benefits as a result of that roll. Okay, this has been done before. This is not new. Okay, but... Hang on. That sounds like uh, what Walmart did, Amazon, all these companies that just buy up all these little small little companies and then they consolidate them underneath them. And next thing you know, they own the entire market. And then where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Mm -mm -mm. What are the clinical consequences of this role? And the Duke University researchers specifically looked at this and they found that after an independent dialysis center was acquired and they examined 12,000 of these, okay, over time, okay, now that EPO, which is the medication that is used to raise the blood level, in other words, to treat the anemia that occurs with kidney failure because the kidneys produce EPO to generate red blood cells in your bone marrow. I know it's kind of weird. Your kidneys actually stimulate your bone marrow. To yes. So I used to get EPO years ago. So EPO or also known as Epogen, which is created by the company Amgen that is used by many dialysis centers. So once a week or so, there's a lot of patients that get EPO injections into the machine like myself. And so that stimulates the bone marrow into creating more red blood cells because dialysis patients by default are anemic. So one, so if you notice somebody is just starting dialysis, they make it cold very easily. Or sometimes we eat a lot of ice. Like I used to eat ice like a fiend back in the day. A lot of times it's because we are anemic. So with, to combat that, they give us drugs that are like epogen. It may be specifically epogen, or it could be a different drug that is like epogen. It could be a you know a different brand, right? But that is what basically helps stimulate the red blood cells, and that drug is also very expensive. Just letting you guys know. So, yes, I can I can vouch for that. create red blood cells who would have thought but when your kidneys fail they stop producing epo so you need an outside shot of epo otherwise you'll become an even okay fine the epo doses increased 200 percent to the exact same patients with the exact same condition the only thing that changed was the ownership of the dialysis center and the epo shots doubled because the dialysis center would make more money off of commercial insurance or Medicare the more EPO doses they gave. Okay, so that EPO was no small amount. It was 25% of the dialysis facility's revenue, a quarter, just from anemia shots. Gaijin girl? Uh, huh. I would say that's uh, evidence that if you monetize things and you create a profit uh, motive, you don't get good decisions. It distorts the decision-making process. <laughs> you got the last word on that one. <laughs> it was 40% of Davida and Fresenius' profit. And guess what? Medicare caught on to this, so they changed their reimbursement policy for EPO such that those facilities could no longer get reimbursed by dose. And when they changed the way they paid, Medicare paid for EPO, the number of EPO shots in the clinics went down by 50%. Same patients, same clinical scenario. All that changed was the way that it was paid for. So it looks like here we have an example of financial interest driving clinical decisions and clinical actions. I mean, you can't get any better than this. Okay. So... Ooh. One thing I want to bring out uh, in, in here, and, and is basically what you just said, especially when it comes to how uh, you have profits driving, you know, medical decisions. Let's talk about profits driving medical decisions. So uh, I want to finish that video, but I I want to go back into Matt Stoller's article. Oop, there we go. 
And I want to share this part with you called Getting Away with Merger. I love how he just. <laughs> that's actually, yeah, that's a good one. He says, despite the expansion of money and infrastructure for dialysis in the U.S., according to nephrologist Leonard Stern, 22% of patients die every year. First of all, that's a lot of people. 22%? That's almost one out of four patients die mm -hmm. every year in dialysis. It's crazy. Versus Japan. Look at that. Yeah. It says versus 5 to 6% in Japan or between 9 to 12% in Western Europe. So what's the difference, Stern asked? Well, for start, most dialyzing in the United States is done for profit. And the for-profit survival is always less than the not-for-profit. Even within the U.S., there is some evidence for this statement, with veterans receiving dialysis through government-run VA having much higher survival rates than those who did outside the VA. Depending on how you do the math, that's an extra 55,000 people dying in America who otherwise wouldn't purely based on the way we do dialysis. Let me let me throw something in with that one. I think Please. almost every, almost everyone who watches your show probably knows the quote that about 68,000 plus people die every year from lack of Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that number does not include the 55,000 that he just quoted. So bump that number up. Mm -hmm. Yep. And here's a thing that I want to, because a lot of people are probably asking the question, well, in what ways does the for-profit affect the quality of life for dialysis patients? I'm going to explain it to you. So it's more financially beneficial for corporations to speed up dialysis to turn over more patients in a shorter frame of time to maximize profits. So I'm going to share something with you guys for a second. With a dialysis machine, you have the pump, right? And what that pump has a certain flow rate. That flow rate corresponds to how fast your dialysis is done. So with the flow rate, uh, the flow rate can correspond to the cleanliness of the blood. So you have what we like to call the clearance level. So according to the CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid Services, or the Department of Health and Human Services, they have a certain clearance level that dialysis patients have to meet. That clearance level is 65%. Clearance, meaning that your blood has to be 65% clean. Because anything above that is great. The more clean, the better, right? But the minimum has to be 65%, right? Meaning that that has to be, that your, that's your clearance. Also corresponding to the KT over V has to be above a certain level. But you know, I don't want to bore you guys with details. That's basically what it is. So in order for that to happen, you have to have your dialysis machine go at a certain speed within a certain frame of time in order to achieve that. Dialysis is basically a cardiovascular workout at rest. So if you ever do a cardiovascular workout, you know how tired you feel after working out. Go for a run do a cardiovascular workout, you know how that feels. So basically, I feel that way. The only difference is I don't have the burning of the muscles because I did not use my muscles in the exertion. Okay? So with that being said, that also can be stressful on the heart. So if you're doing a five or 600 blood flow, it is for that reason that you're doing that blood flow because you only have three to four hours 
of time to dialyze. Versus in places like Japan, they'll do six, seven, eight hour dialysis sessions. But the flow is slower. So they may be doing a 200 to 250 blood flow, which is easier on what? The heart. But because it's not prof for profit, they don't have to turn over as many patients in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of us are dying faster, more often, because these companies want to turn over a profit a lot more. See? And so that's one of the reasons why it is worse off when you have for-profit dialysis facilities than you do have nonprofit or if you have a dialysis facility that is ran in a country that has either single payer healthcare or a nationalized healthcare system. Because we actually survive better. So I'm just going over my notes to make sure I was very thorough. So one of the things I also want to talk about is that high blood flow means you can get a patient out in a shorter period of time, but it's less beneficial to the body. So your kidneys naturally do dialysis in your body, those of you who have healthy kidneys. That being said, then your blood flow is a lot slower than what goes on in the dialysis machine. So because of that, then your body naturally just does dialysis on its own. So the dialysis machine essentially is more rushing the process that your body does at a slower rate. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I also wanted to bring out is this. And I'm not going to read this entire article, but it's very good. Let me share this as well. You're going to start going, oh. It says the profit motive is the problem. But I suspect what Stern meant by for-profit isn't the profit at a random doctor would make on a clinic, but the extreme focus of financial returns demanded by Wall Street investors like Warren Buffett, a billionaire who owns 40% of the Vita's outstanding shares. He After looks all, worse and worse and worse every time you hear something. Oh, yes. I, yes. I, have, a, I have a friend who uh, works with the airlines, and he's got a big chunk of the airlines, too. And he was pretty much just pushing for the profit there, too. And you know what just happened with Boeing? Mm, yep, I believe it. It says, after all, doctors, while they like to make money, don't like to kill their patients. Doctors, however, have been increasingly stripped of power. Technically, every clinic must, by law, have a doctor as medical director, but that doctor never actually has to set foot into the clinic, though most do. Doctors can and are often medical directors for dozens of different clinics. They are also, while often paid well, forced to sign non-compete agreements that limit them from joining a different clinic as medical director in any geographic area for two years after leaving their practice. If a doctor makes the provider mad, it is possible their career could be over. So this is an example of corporations really just making medical decisions over doctors. Now, my dialysis clinic is a non-for-profit dialysis clinic. And yes, we do have a medical director. I see the medical director at least once a week at my dialysis center. But it is not, uh, it's not abnormal for some people to not see the medical director as often. But my med the doctor, the medical director at mine, you see him often. He will he will be in on the floor 
which is one of the reasons why I appreciate him so much. He's a really cool guy, by the way. Uh, so it says it's not just doctors, of course. Patients don't like to get hurt and die. And they would go to a different clinic if their existing provider is awful or throws them out. Unfortunately, those dialysis increasingly have less choice for a clinic. As one economist found, patients are navigating more a more consolidated market over time. Dialysis prices are fixed by Medicare, so competition for patients is over quality. But when facility acquisitions consolidate ownership, clinics lower quality as a result and hospitalization rates rise while survival rates fall. In other words, caregivers and patients can't check the power of a dominant provider once competition disappears and they have no alternatives. Monopoly, baby. That's how it works. So they talk about having dialysis at home, which is was done a lot by next stage, but of course it was taken over. Um, this is one of the things that I also want to talk about. Uh, it says, but it says, uh, and it makes sense. There really doesn't seem to be a lot of hope once you start dialysis, but there should be. Much of the technology to do dialysis hasn't been improved since the 1990s. Hmm, I wonder why. It, <laughs> by now, there should be a lot more that's available. Yep, should be a lot more R&D that have gone into it, but we know why. So it's requiring several machines and a closet full of heavy supplies, but there is new technologies from cr firms like Quanta, uh, DECA Research and Development and Outset entering the space to facilitate at-home dialysis, the equivalent of smartphones to flip phones with remote monitoring and miniaturized equipment. There is no such technical reason a lot of patients shouldn't be able to do dialysis at night over six to eight hours and live much fuller lives and eventually get a kidney transplant. But a classic symptom of, monopol of monopolization is lack of innovation. Uh, and it's, that's particularly brutal here. This is a symptom of capitalism. Mm -hmm. When people say and come to me and go, well, die, well, capitalism breeds innovation. No, it breeds monopolization. Look at, look at movies. Look at movies today. Where's the innovation? <laughs> right? I'm sick and tired of seeing remakes. Yeah. <laughs> it's because... It's, it's covered by, you know, it's because studios, just like all of these different businesses, are controlled by the accountants, and they would much rather go with a sure thing, even if it's like Raiders of the, the, Raiders of the Lost Ark 15, versus something new. <laughs> and that's wow. true of every single industry. Yep, absolutely. So I want to go back to this video, too because he goes over the, over some other factoids that I would like to go over. And I want to get this done because I don't want this, uh, this segment to last too long, but this is very important. So let's continue. Oop. Okay, they also found that 9.5% of the people all of, that went from these independent uh, dialysis facilities to being owned by Fresenius to, 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 to Vita, the, the number of people who were either receiving a transplant or were put on a transplant wait list decreased by 9.5%, by almost 10%. Why? Because if you get a kidney transplant, your kidney failure is cured and you no longer need dialysis and you no longer go to a DeVita or a Fresenius dialysis clinic. So first of all, I want to say is one thing that was educated to me is a transplant is a treatment, not a cure. Because transplanted kidneys can also fail or be rejected. So I call it a treatment, not a cure. But in technical terms, yes, you're cured, right? And so therefore what he said is, if you get a transplant, you don't need to go to dialysis no more. But, and I'm going to quote a tech at my dialysis center. I'm not going to name names. 
They may be watching. Hi. But this text said that they have never seen at, at my dialysis center versus the corporate ones, the for-profit ones. At my dialysis center, they encourage and push transplants more at mine because it's not for profit than they do at the for-profit ones because they've also worked at the for-profit ones and the for-profit ones they don't push them as much now some people may say well no they do just about the same it's not that mm -hmm. that's what i that's what they observed because they're there day in day out you know five six seven days a week so this goes to show when it comes to medical procedures and things like that, when you have corporate profits involved in it, it is never in your best interest. Mm. Yeah. So. Jay, if I can ask, with the, uh, with the EPO shots, because mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the details with these, I would also think that if you have a for-profit clinic, Mm -hmm. They'll be a lot slower in providing extra medication when needed because, oh, my gosh, that's a cost. In other words, they'll be, oh, okay, maybe it's not needed. Let's wait. Let's see. N n no, because they'll pass the cost on to ah, us. Got it. Okay, there you go. And when you're people like me who have Medicaid and Medicare... Well then, who eats that? Who eats that cost? Mm, got it. You. Yes. That's who. So technically, in a sense, you're right, but in another sense, uh, it gets passed on. Also, by the way, it's even stronger, and he gets into this uh, when you have private health insurance because. Medicare is some is is more stern on their prices. Like, no, you can't you can't charge this much. But if you're privately insured, mm. even more so. So he gets into that a little bit too. Uh, let me continue on just a little bit. Okay, again, is this a change? And, and this is again the only thing that changed. The patient didn't change. The only thing that changed was that the clinic ownership changed from being independent to being owned by the or for Zenny's. Okay, I'll leave. So let me share this with you and so that you get uh, more of an explanation. Of uh, you can get on Medicare with dialysis, but it takes two and a half years for that to happen. Now, those commercially insured patients would get dialyzed at the and for Zenny's. They made up about 12% of the patients at the and for Zenny's. However, and this is the big however, these 12% of the patients made up 40% of DaVita and Fresenius' revenue and almost all of the profit because commercial insurance cannot get as good of a deal as Medicare can get. In other words, Medicare just says we're going to pay $250 uh, per dialysis session, uh, $750 to $1,000 a week. And the commercial insurance, the best that they can do is DaVita and Fresenius because they control two-thirds of all the dialysis facilities. They get four times more than what the government gets. So that is why DaVita and Fresenius, they love commercially insured folks because they make, if you've got one person here with Medicare and another person here with commercial insurance, DaVita and Fresenius are getting paid four times more by this person here than by this person here. Okay. So as a basic explanation with this, let's say, okay, so I am literally on dialysis, but let's say hypothetically, you and I are both on dialysis. I have mm -hmm. Medicare, you have private insurance. Let's say at now Blue Cross Blue Shield. So the dialysis center, when because I have Medicare, then Medicare will say, you can only charge $250 for me to dialyze, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But because you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, the dialysis center is now charging your insurance a thousand. So they're charging you a they're charging you a thousand, they're charging me $250. Why? Because Blue Cross Blue Shield cannot compete or they cannot demand that price like Medicare can. Mm -hmm. So that's let another... Me, mm -hmm. let, let me tell you, that is an intro to why 
the public option is not a good idea. Bingo. <laughs> Two tears. Two tears. It's a yep. it's medical apartheid. Mm-hmm. Basically. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to share. Let me go through my, uh, and just let me go through my ending thoughts on this because I have some things to say. So this is why a nationalized healthcare system is necessary. Profits should be eliminated from health. Now imagine having a national health system, AKA America, right? I'm just throwing names out there. Dialysis centers will be operated by AmeriCare and treatments will be geared towards nocturnal dialysis, which could be operated by Mer AmeriCare treatments, would be geared towards, not to, I'm sorry, nocturnal dialysis. And the treatments will be six to eight hours long. Home dialysis will be encouraged and would either be assistant or non-assistant, meaning you can have a dialysis nurse come to your home to monitor you while you're on treatment at home. Also, there would be a massive push towards transplants because that would save us money in the long run. The research and development R&D would be intensified to innovate better ways to do dialysis, such as the artificial kidney being developed, which I actually did that, news story, that good news story a few months back. Every step would be in service of patients and not profits. Better quality of life would be the goal and not the stock price. This is why the system must be changed for survival. Any last words, Gaijin girl? 100%. Um, if last words, we see what's happening in the UK. So there would still be the need to be very politically aware and push. Otherwise we'll get our version of the Tories saying, oh, let's defund the system. Absolutely. Thank you so very much for that. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.